What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Hey Coach Radio. In today's episode, we are walking you through why women should consider a bulk. And neither Coach Zach or I like that word bulk, so we're going to give you our interpretation of what essentially that means. But in this episode, we are in the HQ today, Coach Zach and I. Zach drives all the way up from South Tampa to sit down and have a great conversation with us to provide you guys value. So if you're interested, go ahead and head on over to his page, at ZT Richie. Follow him on Instagram. Dude is getting absolutely jacked. And uh, follow him along in his bodybuilding journey because I, I think it's going to be tremendous. So today I walk you through a woman's episode where we discuss why women should strongly consider a bulk or a lean muscle building phase. I'd like to remind you that if you have any questions for us, you can always hit me up on social media. You can find me at William Grazione on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. It's William Grazione across all platforms. If you're an avid listener of the show, share our podcast with your friends and followers, and we'll be sure to share it on our social media platform as well. And just tag me, and I'll make sure to reshare that so you can get some attention over on your stuff as well. Each week, we provide you our information and experience in the nutritional coaching world to help you apply the knowledge and gain the tools you need to change your life for a better. Coach Zach, thanks for coming in. Yes, sir. I appreciate it, as yeah. always. Mm -hmm. uh, before we went live here on air, we were talking about some specific topics that we will be diving into over the next few weeks. Uh, but the most important thing, which is kind of a joke, but all the concerts that you've been <laughs> attending. So why don't you go ahead and fill me in, Zach. What's been going on with you and your life over the last year? Yeah, man. Especially over the summer, my wife and I would like to attend uh, a lot of live uh, music events. And this week we had a couple. Um, so yeah, we went to, on Wednesday night, the Zach Bryan concert over at Raymond James. Uh, it was awesome. Uh, so much fun. He's a great performer live. Uh, it was amazing. I made some mistakes by hitting legs right before going to it, and it was like 100 degrees outside, and apparently didn't drink enough water, but oh, I was cramping up so bad. I had to stand up, find a place to stand, and barely could make it over there. My legs were hamstrings and quads are cramping so bad oh, no. bought three huge water bottles chugged them all and that was a pretty penny because anything at those events costs so much so it's I spent like 30 bucks in water yeah. just so I'd stop cramping but nice. that was a blast and then over the weekend went and seen uh, a newer country artist Zach Top uh, with my brother and a couple of his friends and it was a blast man good very weekend cool. yeah very cool yeah the uh what went down last week? We had baseball tryouts last yeah. week. So Max got to try out for, he tried out for the AB team the week before, made the AB team, and then last week we did uh, the rec league tryouts. Yeah. So we found out who his coach is going to be, who's going to be on his team, so he's pretty excited about that. And uh, we actually have my son and my daughter's birthday party going down this weekend at our house. Awesome. Uh, they're both celebrating their birthdays together, and I think we have, well, I think a lot of families coming. Wow. So I have uh, the next door neighbor, he's actually offered to help us out with the trimming of our backyard yep. and like cleaning everything up and stuff like that. So it'll be a lot of fun, and uh, maybe you guys will see some of those. How did the uh, baseball events media. go for Max? Baseball went well. I think he did really well. You know, yeah, doesn't surprise um, me. He's yeah, I mean, crazy talented, crazy athletic. Saw so him doing. I see you posting videos of him doing dead hang pull ups, and that's yeah, wild at that age to be yeah. able to do as many as he does. And well, it's like you know, I think the kids are just they kind of become a creature of their environment, right? Yep. So like he sees me working out, he sees mom working out. We're my wife, a tremendous. She homeschools them, yep. um, and. You know, we have the opportunity to kind of create their structure per mm -hmm. se. And whenever my wife works out, she just, hey, you want to come and work out too? And yep. it's like, yeah, of course. So then it's like, well, what should I do? And so on. And because there are a lot of, I think the pull up was the first thing they ever tried. Yeah. In all honesty. And for me, reflecting back, the first thing I ever did was a bicep curl. Yep. I remember it clear as day. I think I was six years old. And my son, my, my daughter, Ocean, they just jump up on there and like, help me, Dad. And they're like, ugh, ugh. And I think Max has gotten up to where he can do, I think he can do four or five in a row. Yeah. You know, and uh, which is pretty cool. So again, like to identify as being strong, I think yeah. is really cool, especially at that age. Now granted, I think where I'm less like, Max son, you need to eat more. Because he doesn't <laughs> have a big appetite, dude. He will. He will run, sprint, jump, play. Oh, he, he just doesn't slow down to eat. He doesn't, man. It's uh, and when when he does, it's like he'll he'll just graze and then he's gone. Yep. 
you know, uh, so that's probably the, the thing that I'm trying to get across to him is like, hey man, like you could be even better yep. if you just ate more food and exactly. you fueled your body properly. So he's doing well. Uh, all the kids are doing well. Again, they're having their birthday party this weekend. Super excited about that as there will be a lot of families there. Uh, by the way, if you're interested, I don't know if you've got plans this weekend, yeah, but if you want to come, so. okay. Saturday, awesome. come on over, hang awesome. out, chill. Um, and I got my daughter in the office today. Yeah. I'm Elena. Special guest. Hello. How are you? Good. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and let's dive into this episode, uh, Why Women Should Bulk. Now, again, Coach Zach and I are not big fans of the word bulk because in, in our eyes, we kind of think, okay, we're bulking we're gaining a lot of weight we're insulin resistant we're yep. doing all the all those processes that i don't necessarily agree with in the world of traditional evidence-based macro coaching which is Quick typically way. making people gain weight you know forcing them to be relatively uncomfortable and in most cases putting weight on their physiology that they are not comfortable with gaining yeah speaking of not comfortable the word bulk will scare away a female client <laughs> real quick real quick <laughs> and so huge reason why i don't like to use that uh, especially with my female clients um but yeah most males you know they're they're comfortable with that term it's a term that most people know um but yeah i'd say just rephrasing things as a way to um, make them more comfortable uh you know whether that's uh, this is going to be an improvement season or a lean building phase, um, something like that, to where they understand that there's no reason for us to put on um, significant adipose tissue. Um, that's not going to benefit, um, you know, our plan for them or mm -hmm. them in general. You know, feeling uncomfortable in their own skin. So, uh, understanding their body composition is going to change. The scale is definitely going to change. Um, but the term bulk can definitely be a, a, a scary, <laughs> a scary term. It absolutely can. And, you know, I think that's what I wanted to dive into here is when you hear that word bulk or what are the connotations and the strategies that we oftentimes hear inside of our space, which is like, it's the reverse diet. It's keeping you at maintenance for six months. It's, uh, you know, reaching the metabolic ceiling. It's, yep. And all of those things, but at the end of the day, what type of people should actually consider yeah. reverse dieting and bulking and all of that? And is it even the right thing for many of them to do? Off camera, before we started, we were talking about the simple fact that there are a lot of nutrition coaches that are recommending reverse diets and building phases and whatever you want to phrase it as. Um, but these people, they are not they're, they're not lean, nope. they're not metabolically adapted, they maybe have some internal health problems that we have to fix, but many of them are overweight or even obese. Exactly. So yeah. in theory, like why would we have to reverse diet or bulk a woman that's already 200 plus pounds? Yeah, and there shouldn't be, that shouldn't be the case. Um, there's obviously something else going on there um, that's causing weight loss resistance. Mm -hmm. um, but in that regard, uh, there's so much energy <laughs> energy availability um, with on you know on their frame that uh, you know putting them into a caloric surplus really isn't going to change much um, in that regard aside from pushing them even further from their goal obviously we're both big advocates of reverse dieting um, you know we use it for many clients um, and maybe those are just going those are typically just going to be clients that are you know slightly overweight um, people who just aren't as lean as they would like to be uh, but people that are coming up coming to us that are significantly overweight or even considered obese um, that's really not something that we would visit um, especially early on uh, you know until we figure out what exactly is going on yeah I would even encourage people to consider the reality of like what's the purpose of reverse dieting if all it does is make the person you're trying to coach even more insulin resistant exactly right so with the weight loss resistance aspect what are the things that we could potentially focus on this is where I believe that the functional medicine side and the evidence-based side need to come t together to actually figure this thing out, yep. right? So in the functional side, what can we essentially do? I mean, in my opinion, I think that oftentimes if you're dealing with somebody that's already, you know, dealing with insulin resistance because maybe, let's say, for instance, they worked with a coach, they reverse dieted that person up to, you know, I don't know, a woman 2,200, 2,500 calories or something, and then in theory, they believe that if I drop them down to 2,000, they should lose a weight fast. Yep. Uh, most of the time you're clearing up a bunch of stored glucose that wasn't there before, but you reverse dieted them for so long, now they have this accumulation. And in many cases, the only way for you to get them insulin sensitive is to do something relatively drastic. Yep. Right. So this is why I'm a big fan of going pretty aggressive when 100%. we get clients that are like, hey, I, 
Will or Zach, I reverse dieted for six months with X coach. They reduced my calories, but I didn't lose any weight. Exactly. And be like, okay, well, what did they do? Well, they yep. just took like 50 grams of carbs away, or they took my carbs from 300 to 220. And I have to provide them the harsh reality of what is essentially necessary in most cases to get a woman to begin to oxidize body fat or yep. take them from a blood sugar level of over 100 down into the 80s. Exactly. And most of the time, it's because they want to be far too conservative. Yep. They're not willing or confident enough to be as aggressive as they need to be to improve insulin sensitivity and then potentially begin to carb cycle. Exactly. Down. Yeah, you can step off the gas, you know, after you get, a, after you get aggressive for a period of time, but... Yeah. Nothing's more motivating than results. And so getting them to the point to where they're seeing results, you know, almost immediately by being a little bit aggressive, um, I definitely think that that's the way to go. So like you said, establishing insulin sensitivity, and that may take some time. Um, so definitely be patient with that. Uh, Cause like you said, they have so much they still need to burn through as far as stored glucose before we even get into, you know, using body fat as an energy source. Yeah, so let's dive into uh, the person that this podcast episode was made for, which is the person that is the you know, chronic low calorie dieter. Yep. And in this regard, so keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, nutrition coaching has to be context and client dependent, yep. right? The reason why we went on and we talked about the overweight or the obese client or the insulin resistant person or the person that's reverse dieted for X amount of months with a coach and they've gained 10, 20, 30 pounds. The reason we talked about them first is because we want to identify the fact that we don't believe that they are the person who needs to spend six months reverse dieting. Yep. But the person that's coming to you and maybe their average average height and weight, you know, maybe they're addicted to exercise, maybe they got addicted to doing too much dieting, or maybe they worked with a coach and that coach just provided them a meal plan that was very low calories and they didn't know anything else, so they just followed this thing for a very long period of time until they can no longer follow it, maybe because the adherence factor, their hunger's so crazy, or they're just so metabolically adapted. They're like, I know something needs to change. I listened to one of your podcast episodes or I saw this post, but I don't know what to do. So reversing metabolic adaptation, that's one of the primary reasons why we should consider a build or a lean phase or a bulk. Yep. But in that context, it doesn't mean you have to gain 20 pounds in order to just improve your metabolism. Exactly. What it does mean though, is that we should fuel your body, reaching a elevated or call it a ceiling of calories that you can metabolize on a 24 hour time basis, yep. gaining very slowly over the course of time, assuming that the majority of the weight that you're gaining is quality lean body mass, mm -hmm. okay? Now, as we do that, you could also then theorize that the individual could potentially become more insulin sensitive. Yep. Because of the fact that we're reducing stress, and if you're a woman from 35 to 50, chances are your stress is negatively influencing your blood sugar as well. Exactly. Yeah, so, I love taking, this is one of my favorite phases to take um, one of my female clients through. Um, just because a lot of times, you know, even by seeing, uh, you know, switching things up and going from this chronic, uh, you know, caloric deficit they've been in forever, you know, all these chronic dieters, um, they'll notice by adding in, you know, slowly adding in more nutrition, um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, providing a new and improved training stimulus that they're progressing with on a weekly basis um, for the ones that, uh, you know, can uh, physically uh, train. Um, a lot of times we're seeing body composition improve even during this phase. Um, so even though the main goal isn't uh, fat loss, we can still see uh, body fat percentage drop um, as weight is going up just because of that weight, let's say 90 plus percent of the weight that we're adding on is lean muscle tissue um, just because, you know, from a uh, caloric standpoint and um, really macro manipulation, um, we're putting on that weight in the right way. Right. Um, so if you're adding weight um, and let's just say we add on, you know, over a month, two pounds and one point or 1.75 of that is lean muscle tissue, you just saw body fat percentage drop. And sure, body fat didn't drop, but body fat overall, body fat percentage dropped. And so body uh, body composition is obviously changing. Um, and so clothes, their clothes are fitting better, you know, maybe tighter in the right spots, um, looser in the right spots, uh, you know, feeling better. And once again, like you said, improving your overall um, 
metabolic rate. And so yeah, that definitely. metabolic flexibility can definitely improve. I've noticed that as of late, I've actually been uh, requesting that a fair amount of my clients go and get an in-body scan done. Yeah. Now, I don't say the in-body is 100% gold standard, but yeah. I think it's something to work with. So as an example, you have somebody that's coming in and maybe they are more of a chronic dieter and they've never truly felt great. You know, low cat, maybe low calorie, low energy. They know they're not building any muscle. They're not getting any stronger. Their physiques kind of stay the same for a long period of time. With those specific types of clients, I'm actually recommending that they go to like one of these EOS gyms yeah. or one of these gyms that has an in-body scanner yeah. and just get some preliminary information. 100%. Just get some data. Yeah, it may not be accurate, but a lot of times it is something that is, uh, you know, it's consistent. And yeah. so it's something that we can use as a tool to monitor, um, to monitor progress. And so yeah. I like to do that. There's tons of places they can go. A lot of times you can pay a $10 fee to most HRT clinics just use their in body, or you can go to like a vitamin shop or GNC. A lot of them have uh, in bodies as well. They'll charge you a small fee to use it, but yeah, the more data, the better. And so I'm always a, a fan of um, having that as a tool to use. I definitely agree, and it's really cool because we don't no longer really. I mean, in all honesty, if you really unpack this, but you know, you remember back in the day, it was like pre 2020. Everybody just trust the process, just trust the process, just yep. trust the process. But nobody was presenting the data yep. to say, well, what's what's there to trust? Yep. You know, like uh, I need a reverse diet for six months. Why? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, show me some blood work. Show me some something. Show me some something that basically validates where I was versus where I'm going. Yep. And this is why I like the in body data is because essentially you have a good idea of like how much lean body mass they have, how mm -hmm. much fat mass they have in starting, what their you know their BMR is, and all that kind of information. And then you go ahead and take them through this process and we kind of do it a bit differently than the way that most people do it, which is, you know, trying to keep you as insulin sensitive as possible, trying our best to manage stressors, optimizing your sleep, training in a manner that allows you to stimulate your body, but then also not to annihilate your body and properly recover from it. And feeding them appropriately, a specific amount of calories that's necessary to have them close to their maintenance level. And then we revisit that maybe three, four, five, six months later on down the road, and we can clearly see like, oh my gosh, wow, look at this. You built this this many pounds yep. of lean body mass. Your metabolic rate went up this or this much. Your fat mass went from this to this. And in most cases, we are experiencing a lot of people that are recompositioning, Yep. right? So the act of building muscle and losing body fat simultaneously because the stimulus is so novel and the fact that they're eating enough calories to fuel the performance, which ultimately allows them to get stronger, build more muscle then you want to stack on like a really positive lifestyle on top of that yep. maybe with some additional supplementation and things like that then you can actually see them transform and I think that's where you set people up to begin a really successful fat loss phase uh, without having to push through 20 pounds of you know accumulated body fat exactly before they get back to where they were when they started with you yeah I definitely think this is a phase that I almost like to use more tools than what I even do during a fat loss phase more than anything just to uh, just because I really like to keep the client comfortable um, I understand that this is something that you know they may have never done in their life as far as intentionally increase caloric intake intentionally put on some weight um, body weight and so a lot of times those are some times that I will uh, like to monitor maybe like you the, through the use of a glucometer um, daily blood glucose readings um, maybe using some more supplementation to increase insulin sensitivity whether that's a GDA or um, some other things to improve digestion, um, whether that's, you know, fiber, probiotics, digestive enzymes, things like that. I like um, L-carnitine. -car L-carnitine, I love. One of my favorite supplements. Um, and then, uh, you know, and then using a lot of other tools to, to monitor uh, progress. Uh, mm -hmm. Just once again, to just uh, put them at ease. Uh, put them at ease that, hey, we're doing the right thing. This isn't just us trying to uh, get you fat. And so we're doing everything to prevent that. Absolutely. Yeah, let's um, dive into, I guess, the biggest reason why this is, is because oftentimes, I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to understand the fact that when you're chronically calorie restricted, mm -hmm. you're, you end up losing a fair amount of lean, lean body mass. Yeah. And the larger your quote unquote engine is, the smaller your engine is, the less fuel that it demands 100%. to perform. Yeah. The bigger the engine is, the more fuel it's going to demand to perform. Yeah, more energy-dependent tissue. Absolutely, sure. right? And so let's think about this logically. If 
you've spent the last two, three years trying to focus on weight loss or getting lean when you've realized like, okay, nothing's really happening anymore. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. Coach is recommending my macros, I'm checking in, I'm taking pictures, I'm doing all the stuff, but I've stalled out. And yeah. I stalled out a long time ago. Like I talked to a guy uh, here the other day, it's like he said he's been stalled out for over a month. And I'm like, well, are you gonna change anything? Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, but in this regard, our goal is to make our female clients the strongest versions of themselves. Yep. Right? And it's to regain or to rebuild all of the lost tissue that they have lost because of their efforts. Yep. Now, it's also to unlock potentially new tissue that they've never even had, yep. right? Because they've never eaten enough calories and trained the way that we're asking them to train in order to build that muscle. Yep. So oftentimes, we're getting them stronger than they've ever been, they feel better than they've ever felt, right? Their gym performance is better than ever, and ultimately, we get them to a point where, guess what? Now they're ready for fat loss. Exactly. Because when they lose the body fat, now they can actually see the muscle. Yep. Whereas before, they're just so focused on weight loss that they could lose some weight, but they're like, I, you know, I lost the weight, but yeah. I didn't look the way I no, wanted to look. I, still I didn't have shoulders, and, I didn't yeah. have glutes, I didn't have quads and hamstrings, just look, just flat. Yep. You know? Yeah, exactly. So, all right, let's dive into the next thing. This is a little bit deeper, so this is more like in the functional side. So, hypothyroidism happens all, all the time, and what I want to talk about is the correlation between hypothyroidism and chronic low calorie intake. Yeah. All right? So, uh, for reference, I have helped, I don't, I mean, I don't have a number, uh, but I've helped a lot of people that have came to me, specifically women, that have came to me with their T3 levels being under 2.3. Yep. You know, and 2.3 may not be clinical hypo, but it's pretty dang close. Yep. And anything that's 2.3 or less, I'm like, hey, what's your past three to five years of dieting actually look like? Can you, can you paint a picture for me? And they're like, well, I've, I've just never intentionally ate enough. Or, yep. I was on, you know, a thousand calorie, then I went to like fifteen hundred and fourteen and thirteen. So they're always constantly living in the calorie restricted state. And when we actually look at blood work, so we can do that either if we have clients here locally in Tampa, we can utilize a, an affiliation we have with Legacy Health and Wellness. We can get blood work done through them, um, and then when we get that blood work back, we can go ahead and we can dive through them and say, okay, well, this is where all your level, levels are at. What's your lifestyle look like? And then what lifestyle changes can we make to optimize this? And then what supplementation do we need to implement in order to fill these gaps? Yep. One of the primary things that we can do from a lifestyle intervention perspective with women that have hypothyroidism is to feed them more calories. 100%. Because of the impact that glucose has on leptin, which then sends signals to TSH, T4, T3 reverse, and essentially deload the stress that could potentially be driving T3 down and uh, driving T, uh, reverse T3 up, we want to reduce that stress so that therefore we can drive T3 up and lower reverse T3, which ultimately makes your metabolism capable of burning more energy doing the same thing. Exactly. Yeah, I think you hit it on the head. I think it's going to be supporting your adrenals. Um, the correlation and the connection between your adrenal gland and thyroid function is uh, is, is really spot on. And so if you, uh, if you support the adrenals, um, a lot of times you're going to see thyroid function improve. Um, mm -hmm. Like you said, it's being the state of chronic, chronic stress. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's really going to be based upon, uh, like you said, it's going to be uh, chronic dieting, being in a, mm -hmm. uh, in being in a state of uh, consuming low calories for such a long period of time. And a lot of times that also comes with um, what I would say is, okay, some would call it overtraining. Um, I would probably uh, call it under fueling, um, you know, to support that, uh, that training. Uh, it may be a fine amount of training, but if you're under fueling, then obviously I guess you could call it over training. Um, so it, it's going to be, what can we do to reduce stress? Um, a lot of times that's, uh, going to be lifestyle changes from the start. And then it's, uh, you know, obviously a lot of supplementation that we can do to support the adrenals. Um, and even directly support the thyroid gland. Um, obviously, we need to uh, provide the tools necessary for the thyroid to function properly. Yeah, I love the fact that you brought up the adrenal glands because it's actually part of our process when we bring somebody in that we identify as having maybe a higher like stress um, questionnaire. Yeah. You know, so when they're you know 30, 40 plus, it's like what's actually going on internally, and then what do we have to be able to improve or optimize in order to get them back online. Yep. One of the primary things that we like to do is to support the adrenals and potentially consider eliminating caffeine, right, to get their body to release cortisol when it's supposed to. Because ultimately, the, the connection that I, that I see a lot is the simple fact of this. 
you're stressed from your diet because it's low calorie. Yep. You're not recovering, you're not sleeping well. Okay, let's just take that for what it is. The next day you wake up, you're exhausted. Yep. Well, what do people do when they're tired? Give me stimulants, yep. give me pre-workout, give me caffeine, give me these things. You do that long enough, over a long enough duration of time, the amounts of the stimulants keep going up, the frequency of the stimulants keep going up, and this essentially causes adrenaline insufficiency. 100%, right? And when you see that on a Dutch, it's also, it's, it's extremely surprising. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then you just yeah. see that graph is all over the place, mm -hmm. um, usually a huge spike before bed. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you wake up, you know, that's it's not even getting near the spike that they're seeing before bed. It should not be quite the opposite. Yeah, and so, prioritizing the health of the adrenal glands in this specific, you know, in most cases, I can see it dramatically improve over like two to four weeks. Oh yeah. Um, and then if you decide to add a, like a stimulant back in, add it in intentionally. Yep. You know, add it in like, okay, maybe I'm doing uh, a workout this morning. Okay, yep. cool. Well, can we kind of pair the caffeine or the stimulant with the natural rise in cortisol? 100%. Right, you're pairing that together. Then maybe you go do your spin bike for 30 minutes or whatever to get your cardio in. Or if it's a training day and you train early, okay, well, let me go ahead and maybe have a cup of yeah. coffee or something Use like that. Use it as a tool rather yeah. than something that you are dependent on. Yeah, so think about it like, uh, you know, you have a natural rise in cortisol in the morning. It begins to taper off, usually for most, depending, like 11, 12 o'clock or something. But then as it's falling down, imagine if you stack like two scoops of pre-workout when it's naturally falling down, then that re-stimulates your body. And then even worse if you're doing it at like six or seven o'clock at night, yep. you know what I mean? And that's what basically gets people to a position where they have a flip-flop circadian rhythm and they have very low cortisol in the morning, which basically makes you feel like a walking zombie, unless you get a cup of coffee or yep. a pre-workout or whatever. Uh, and then you have a spike at the end of the day, which does negatively impact your sleep because you just end up laying there in your bed being like, oh my God, what's going on? How come I can't fall asleep? It's because you have a flip-flop circadian rhythm. So the release of cortisol, the release of melatonin, they're basically flopped. Yep. So you have this rise in cortisol at nighttime and that's basically keeping you up at night. Um, hormone balance. So this is obviously something that I think is, falls in line with metabolic adaptation. You know, back in 2015, 16, 17, 18, uh, nobody really identified what metabolic adaptation was, mm -hmm. you know, and, and at its root, like what truly is it? Um, we can talk about that in detail in another podcast episode. I feel like that's another like 20, 30 minutes that you and I could just yeah, that's talk back about. when they were still calling it metabolic syndrome, you know, yeah. before or damage. Yeah, yeah. You know? um, but the term keeps changing. That's yeah. for sure. The good news is you're not broken. <laughs> the yeah, good exactly. news is, is that. You can be repaired, you can be fixed, but it all starts internal first. So let's dive into the improving hormone balance and why you know having a point in time where, again, I'm going to use the word bulk, but it's not. The intention is to build muscle. That's really the intention. So you call it a muscle building phase, a lean body mass phase, like whatever you want to call it. Um, but our way of doing it is a little bit different than the majority of coaches that are doing it because all they're thinking about is, oh, I need to keep you at calorie maintenance, even if you gain 10, 20 pounds, I don't care. You need to care because that's fat you're gonna to have to take off of them later on. Hormone imbalances. Um, besides hypothyroidism, Coach Dak, what are some hormone imbalances that you oftentimes see with people that are chronic low calorie dieters? Chronic low calorie dieters. Um, a lot of times we're gonna see sex hormones pretty much crashed that's um, where i was going yeah. specifically testosterone and it plays such a significant role in body composition based goals mm -hmm. um so it's 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 almost uh guaranteed that if someone is a chronic dieter or has extremely low body fat uh or has just completed a um a long strenuous fat loss phase uh, they're usually going to see low test um, and a lot of times that'll also come with a, a number of other things. Uh, maybe progesterone is kind of all over the place. Um, menstrual cycle obviously is going to be one of the first signs. Um, any sort of uh, amenorrhea or, um, you know, any sort of, uh, I would say, uh, if, if your period's kind of uh, irregular, um, yeah. you're, you're, you're usually going to notice that you are experiencing some of those things yeah. um, due to your intake as well as uh, maybe... Um, I, once again, uh, just uh, your your output being kind of uh, kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, but once again, you know, kind of you, you touched on it at the beginning. Um, if we are seeing some of these things uh, for an obese individual or someone who's uh, extremely overweight, obviously we're going to go about that differently than what we're talking about right now. Um, yeah. 
just because uh, their hormonal profile is going to improve significantly just by losing some of that fat tissue. Um, you know, all, a lot of times they're going to be more experiencing estrogen dominance uh, just to, because of the amount of fat tissue they have. Because um, adipose tissue does carry um, is a great storage. It's a great storage place for estrogen. So they're they're able to hold and carry more um, estrogen. Um, just due to the amount of body fat they're they're, they're holding on to. Absolutely. I'm just going to bring this up. It's not even really was a part of the show. I kind of wanted to end the show, but I yeah. um, wanted to bring this up because we had a, a, a gentleman out that was brought to our attention the, the other day. And the gentleman's almost 300 pounds, yeah. five foot nine. It's a very large human, right? Yeah. He's on, he, is, he is on a statin, exercises a lot, but he's also on low-dose testosterone. Yeah. Now, 300-pound guy... On low dose testosterone, not using an estrogen blocker. Mm. Can you talk about that real quick? Yeah, and so uh, I guess, and I know I didn't dive into it very much, I guess if they're trying the natural route with maybe using some like DIM or maybe using boron and things like that, awesome. I guess that's a great place to start with. Um, but with that amount of fat tissue, uh, and then now we're trying to increase his testosterone. Uh, a lot of times when you're carrying that much fat tissue, your sex hormone binding globulin is gonna be pretty active. Mm -hmm. It's usually going to see a lot of that testosterone aromatized, specifically because of all the fat tissue we serve. And there's so there's gonna be a lot of conversion and more space, uh, more body mass as far as fat tissue goes for him to store that estrogen, just making it even more difficult to lose that body fat. Um, and more difficult to improve his body composition. So, so would you say overweight and obese individuals have a higher ability to Higher propensity to, to convert, yeah. And so usually there's a, a yeah, they're aromatizing at a much higher rate um, than someone who is of a, uh, a more respectable body composition. So. All right, all right. So yeah, that's that's interesting that they wouldn't yeah. start him on. I hear that a lot. Of, um, I do know, hear it a lot, especially men that are on H H or HRT that they're yeah. just not recommending a blocker. Yeah, and so as and, and that's just putting him in a, a terrible position. So now we're looking at obviously his lipid panels are probably going to increase. Um, he's, I mean, the biggest thing is they're probably putting him on HRT to improve body composition, mm -hmm. and they may be doing the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. um, he may just be aromatizing the majority of that testosterone into estrogen. Yeah. I mean, especially if he's already that overweight when he started. Exactly. You know, interesting. All right, cool. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in to episode 109 of Hey Coach Radio. Coach Zach, as always, brother, yes, I really thank appreciate you. you coming in to the HQ yeah. this morning to shoot this episode. And if you guys have any questions for us, once again, you can find me on the social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and now YouTube, as well as the podcast will be available on iTunes, Spotify, and Libsyn. Thanks so much for tuning in. God bless. We appreciate you. And uh, we'll see you in the next one. Peace. Man, we went all over the place. And I feel like it all tied in so well. I love podcasts. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Just, it's always so natural. Uh, it's always so natural. <laughs>